Yes, we are studying the five countercultural ways of the kingdom. We're saying pretty much that God, our Christ, our Savior, Jesus, calls us to a different life. It's a life that's going to be counter flesh. We don't want to do it. <laughs> it's going to be countercultural. It's going to be unlike this world. And by the way, when we are different, that's when we start to shine. That's when we start to live compelling lives and make people want to know more about our Jesus and we get to share the gospel. So week one, we talked about how enemies are to be loved. Week two, we talked about how to find life, life, you must lose it. Last week, we talked about how hiddenness, a life of private, hidden devotion is the way to true recognition from God. We looked at giving and serving, what could be giving, and prayer. And we said that to live like this is to really live for God's true recognition. Now, I want to just say something because I was thinking about, you know, after I preached this sermon, I beat myself up for the rest of the week. Like, should have said that, that was overblown, that was, you know. And I was realizing one thing, and that is in my zeal, to really, really, really emphasize the importance that we don't do things for the praise of people, but we do things for God and for growing. I might have overemphasized, and what I mean by this is our church needs to hear how God is answering your prayers. Our church needs to hear uh, stories of how God is changing things and doing things in your life. We need good examples of people who read their Bibles and pray. So I want to just let you know that put it out for you on the table that do not leave your private life underdeveloped, but also shine and lead others into a deeper life as well. But today, we're going to begin um, sermon number four. And simply titled, it's going to be this, The Way Up is Down. The Way Up is Down. I want to talk to you today about humility, that rare heart quality, humility, going down as a form of going up, exaltation. And we'll get very clear on what all that, is, all that means. But you know what? The Bible is so clear on the call to humility. We are to be people of humility. Let me just give you a flavorful taste of what the Bible calls us to. Look at Psalm 138, verse 6. Though the Lord is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. Though lofty, he, seems, uh, he sees them from afar. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Micah 6, 8, he has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. Not like material poverty, but poverty of spirit, brokenness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourself. Humble. That's going to be the cry of tonight, today. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. What does that even mean? We're going to get into that. Now, today's sermon is about humility. And we're going to get into the practical things, the application at the end of the sermon. But today we have to establish the foundation. You see, one of the biggest foes, enemies of humility is, well, I'm going to introduce this foe in the form of a prayer. In fact, I want to invite you all to join me and pray with me this prayer. It's right from the Bible. Would you do that? In Luke chapter 18, here's what we read. God, I thank you. You're going to follow me? That I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers. Come on, guys. Or even like this tax collector, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. How did you feel reading that? (laughs) Awkward, cringy. Okay, so today, one of the greatest enemies of humility is self-righteousness. 
It is just one foe. There are other enemies. And, and pride has a way of sneaking up on us and rearing its ugly head in a hundred thousand ways. But today, I want to speak to one of the more, more important ones because it robs us of entrance into the kingdom. It robs us of the blessed life before it even robs us of our marriages, ruins our relationships. It does something far more. I'm actually going to read this prayer in the context of Luke 18. Here's what Jesus writes. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you. It's really hard not to laugh at this, but we're really talking about this could be going on in your heart, right? That I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That is the prayer of every believer. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You see, I think pride often looks like in two very, very big ways. On the one hand, it can look like rebellion. It's saying, God, your word says this. No, thank you. I'm going to do it my way. Your word calls me to redeem my time and spend it well and steward it well. But guess what? I want to do whatever I want. Your word calls me to purity and physical intimacy belongs in a covenantal marriage. But guess what? Nope, I'm going to have it my way. Your word calls me to serve. Nope, I'm going to have it my way. Rebel, it, it, it's a form of pride. But pride also looks like self-righteousness and self-righteousness is the opposite of rebellion at least on the surface because it is has all the components of obedience you're following jesus you're submitted to his word and yet it's still pride why because in rebellion the pride says i won't submit that's the essence of pride in rebellion but in self-righteousness, pride says, I will submit, but I will not depend. I will submit, but I will not trust in the work of the cross. I will submit, but I will rely on my submission. Look at me. <laughs> Look what I've done. Look at my devotion. Look at my religion. Look how much I go to church. Look how much I tithe. Look how much I pray. Look at my walk of purity. Look at my walk of prayer. Look at me. And pr a pride in self-righteousness is a form of submission to the laws of God. But deeper is a trust in your own merit and not the merit of Jesus I want to talk to you about self-righteousness as the great, great enemy of humility. And I think this prayer, I have four parts for you. Part one is we're going to look at the prayer of the Pharisee. And we're going to diagnose what self-righteousness looks like. Part two, we'll look at what humility looks like. Part three, we'll talk about what exaltation means. And part four, how this kind of humility, this tax collector humility invades all of our relationships and transforms all of our relationships. Come on, Mercy. What do our marriages need most? Humility. What does our parenting most need? Humility. What do our friendships most need? Humility. What does Mercy Church need most? Humble leaders, humble people. So let's talk about the first one, marks of self-righteousness. I have six quick 
points, I think they're quick, about how to diagnose righteousness, self-righteousness. And it's really from this text. We're going to be right in this text. So, first mark of self-righteousness is this. Here's how you know if you're on that path. You speak a lot about yourself. It's so simple. But there's an obsession and a self-focus of all of your merits. Look at this Pharisee in verse 11. God, I, now we're going to circle the word I and see how many times he says I. I'm going to overly emphasize it. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give thanks of all that I get. That's five I's. Notice how the merits that he is focused on divide into two main categories, the moral and the religious. The moral, it's that he is not like, I guess, the um, extortioner, the adulterer, the person who's unjust, or the tax collector who's a shady guy. That's the moral part. He is focused on him and how moral he is. Moralism is a great enemy of the gospel. He is so amazed with how he's moral and unlike other people. Now, it's not just morality, it's religion. His devotional life, he fasts twice a week. Now, we've been talking about these Pharisees for a couple of weeks already. I mean, that's a big, big price to pay and to give tithes of all that I get. I do not doubt that this tax collector really did pay tithes of all that I get, even things like herbs, you know? Like everything they ever got, they would like divvy up and count off a 10% and give it off. He is incredibly moral, an incredible religious leader. And yet, he is self-righteous. He is not focused on what Jesus has done. He's more interested in his work than the work of the cross. This is why I love for our prayers on Tuesdays and Thursdays. The first thing we always do, and Rebecca and Amy lead us in this, is we focus on God's deeds. A Christian has his eyes on God. A humble Christian has his eyes on God, not on themselves. Psalm 77 says these words, and this is the heart of our faith. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all of your works. I will consider all of your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Second mark of self-righteousness is that you have contempt for people, for sinners whose sins are not like yours. Contempt for people. Notice the very opening line of verse 9, excuse me, the second clause of verse 9. And treated others with contempt. One of the surest ways to know if I have a self-righteous heart is to ask yourself, how do I feel about other sinners? The word contempt is, an, I mean, sorry guys, it's a nasty word. It's disgust with a fellow image bearer. doesn't matter how fallen they may be. They are an image bearer. And self-righteousness has, treats those people with contempt. How do you feel? How do you look at others who are struggling in areas that you're not struggling, in sins that are not your sins? If I can get very, very honest, do we have contempt for people who have committed outrageous moral failure? Do we have contempt for members of the LGBT community? Do we have contempt for homeless on the street? Do we have contempt for the protesters at universities who are breaking the law. Now, I, I, I'm upset at that. But is it contempt? Is it disgust? Is it absolute hate? Because none of those things have anything to do with kingdom people. You see, how we are to respond is with weapons of prayer and compassion and brokenness. 
This is a question for all of us. Self-righteous people have a deep sense of contempt for others. Number three, self-righteousness looks like not just contempt, but it's engaged in selective comparison. (laughs) Selective comparison. (laughs) Comparison, I don't think, is wrong if you compare yourself to God (laughs) and His holiness. That's actually a really good practice. But comparison that's selective, that props up my feeling of goodness, is wrong. I was reading on Yahoo, so I don't know if that's a trustworthy source or not. There was a, in 2021, I'm already laughing at this, but there was a study done, and in this study, uh, in a recent study of 2,000 U.S. residents, 81% said they believe that humankind is inherently good, and three in four believe that they are fundamentally a good person. Okay, but this next part is really funny. But when asked how they would compare themselves to others in their life, 46% went a step further admitting to a belief that they're better than everyone else they know. Almost half of all Americans believe they're the best person they know. A new survey survey suggests. (laughs) Raise your hand. That's you. Raise your hand. (laughs) I'm teasing you like nobody would do that. But you know what? I was actually wondering about this. Like, is that, is that what I do? You see, whatever you're conquering, wherever God has given you victory, it's so easy to start comparing yourself to people who are struggling in that exact area. If your marriage is doing well, what do you do? Man, that marriage. If you're walking a life of purity, what do you do? Well, I'm sure they're addicted. If you're walking a life of devotions and you're reading your Bible and you're fasting, what do you do? You start judging other people in a way to feel good about yourself. If you're generous, what do you do? You start judging, comparing yourself to just how ungenerous others are. They must not really love God like you do. Or if you're serving, oh, Mercy Church, we are a church of incredible volunteers. May it never be that we look at others and say, gee, could you serve a little more? Because I serve a lot. Look at me. I love Jesus more probably than you. You know what? Let's compare ourselves. But not selectively. Let's go vertical. If you have a good marriage, I want you to know one thing. Compare your marriage to the ultimate marriage of the groom loving the bride. Oh, you'll be a lot to learn. If you're good at parenting, Compare yourself to the Father's tender care of His children. If you're good at friendship and betrayal and gossip is so beneath you, you cannot even think of those words. I want you to think about what a friend you have in Jesus. If you are particularly good at listening and sympathizing with people and listening to them and caring for them, look to Jesus who is the great sympathizer, who sympathizes with all of our weakness. You see, Mercy Church, the self-righteous, they look this way. Self-righteous selectively choose their samples. But if you go vertical, Mercy Church, you cannot walk away proud. (laughs) Number four, the proud, self-righteous people, they remain shallow. They don't examine hearts, their hearts. Notice all of these things that this tax collector does. Excuse me, Pharisee, because tax collector is a good guy. The Pharisee, he is only worried about surface stuff. There's something about self-righteous people is that they're always going to be on the surface. They're only judging external obedience. Notice what's missing is this Pharisee asking God, search my heart and know me. God, cleanse me from hidden faults. He's not going deep. Self-righteous people are incredibly shallow. Because you know what? (laughs) If you look inside your heart, by the way, I think one of the best assumptions, starting places for a sermon like this, is this is not a humble preacher speaking to a humble crowd. I really believe this is a proud preacher preaching to 
proud listeners. That's where we start. I, I think if any time you're amazed with your humility, you, you've, you've become proud. There was a simple uh, analogy. I didn't plan to say this, but somebody gave some church member an award for humility. And they kept just wearing it and brandishing it everywhere. So they had to remove it. Because now all of a sudden, they're proud. But you see, think about our hearts. Think about what goes on the inside of us. Oh, how tricky if you think about our motives, if you think about our desires, you start thinking about, it. listen, there's, you, you will not like it. In, in me, there are selfish motives, motives for self-glory. In you are motives for your rights to be right. All of us have this. I was even thinking about, man, pride in your heart just works just miraculously. Like, it's always there. Pride is always there. Think of this example. I was thinking of this example. Like, if I bought Albina flowers, let's just say on a random Tuesday. It's been a long time. I went to QFC. Middle of the day, I bought her flowers. Guess what happens? I'm walking out of that store, and I'm thinking, gee, I wonder who else is doing this. I wonder if my brother Sergio has ever done something like this. Probably not. I took time off work, went to QFC, got her flowers. Look at me. And then what happens? You're like, shoot. I'm so proud. You repent. And you say, God, forgive me for those thoughts. God, if this is noble, this is from you. And then guess what happens? Two seconds later, pride comes back. and says, look at you, repenting for your pride. You are amazing. And then you repent for this pride. And then two seconds later, Look at you. You're repenting for this bride, of this bride, of that bride. And it's going to go on, Mercy Church. Look in your heart. Examine your motives. Uh, there's some, this is a real, real mark of self-righteous people. They never go below the surface. Oh, there are so many things in my heart. There are so many things in your heart that if you look at once, your, your pathway becomes a pathway of humility. It humbles you. Number four. Five, excuse me. The fifth mark of self-righteousness is there's no plea for pardon. Praying for forgiveness is a rarity. Self-righteous hearts, as I have, sometimes you have, maybe you have it today, do not repent. You just don't. Or you repent rarely. This is why I find conviction to be so sweet. Anytime you're at church, anytime you're listening to a good sermon, anytime you're reading the Bible, anytime you're talking to somebody who offers great correction and your heart starts to be convicted, I want you to let you know you should rejoice because it is God drawing you into his life. But you know what self-righteous people do? They, have, they rarely repent. Let me ask you this question. Do you live a life of repentance, continual repentance? And not the kind of repentance that's like the meal prayer repentance. God bless this food. God forgive me for all my sins. But I mean, do you, do you bring your sorrow? Do you actually allow the Holy Spirit to work sorrow into your heart as you ponder a failure? As you get specific, like crystal, I mean, very precise, very exact. Mercy Church. A sure sign of self-righteousness is someone who's trying to follow after Jesus and they don't lead a life of continual repentance, daily repentance. I also want to recommend our church prayers on Tuesday and Thursday. We take time to repent because that's our life. That's our life. We're keeping our hearts safe, um, excuse me, safe from pride. Number six. The sixth mark of self-righteous heart, if number five is there's no plea for pardon, number six, there's no plea for God's power. Nowhere in these verses does this Pharisee ask God for his power. Ask God to live out this obedience, life of submission with his grace, the kiss of heaven, the energy of heaven. Nowhere. Mercy Church, 
We are a people who are, believe the cross is not just pardon, it is power. All of our work of obedience, husbands trying to love their wives like Christ loves the church. Wives trying to follow their husbands like the church follows Christ. Parents, friendships, whatever they may be, right? Single life, whatever, life of purity, whatever it may be. All of our life is powered by the grace of God. The grace of God is not just for when you mess up. It's not just your insurance policy that bails you out in a moment of crisis. Grace of God goes ahead of you securing your victories. You live a per, as a person who's completely reliant on God's power. You wake up in the morning and say, God, I am not to the task today. Not to the temptations. Not to the anger. Not to loving and leading my family. I'm not up to the task but God, would you work in me? I need your strength. I need your help. God, without you, I can do nothing. Do we believe that? This Pharisee felt like he got it under control. Do you feel like you've got your walk with Jesus under control? Or do you ask God for help? Marks of self-righteousness. But that brings us to the good example. Marks of gospel humility. Look at what the tax collector says in verse 13. What a contrast. This is night and day. St By the way, the tax collector was somebody who was on the bottom rung of social acceptability. Tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The tax collector is an example of brokenness. A tax collector has no merits. By the way, this tax collector probably had some good deeds. In that moment, in the presence of God, he simply acknowledges one true fact about himself. Sinner, sinner, sinner. I believe this should be everyone's prayer here today. You're like, yeah, I've been a Christian 18 years. Not today. This is our prayer. We humble ourselves. We are a people who are completely reliant on the grace of God. Knowing that we are sinners and our hearts are full of wickedness and rebellion and pride and bitterness. He is a sinner and he appeals to the mercy of God. God, be merciful to me. God, I need your mercy. Oh, how, should I, how I pray that that would be our hearts today. God, I need you. I need your mercies. I am a sinner. Mercy Church, would you pray that in your prayer daily? He's the one. He's the one. He's the remarkable one. He's the awesome one. He's the author of all of our victories. He's our strength. He's the redeemer of our past. He's the hope of our glorious future. He's the purpose of our existence. He is the lover of our souls. Mercy Church, this is our cry. It's a plea for the mercies of God. And God, of course, the miracle in this story is he lavishes his grace. <laughs> you know, I, I, sometimes I feel like I think, and I'm going to project on you, we think, that God is just bound to be merciful. No. Mercy is mercy. It is a volitional choice of God to show us favor when we deserve condemnation. And in the moment of repentance, he chooses to show you mercy. Mercy. If you are wondering if that's true, think about the angels. He did not die for the angels. He let angels stand hardened and condemned. He could have done that for humanity, but he decided to show mercy to all who would run to him. Now, the beauty of this passage is part three, is that there's exaltation. Now, what is this exaltation? Well, it's in verse 14. 
I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. Okay, justified. Like if you have your Bible open, you circle that word. That is one of the key words in the Bible. Justified. 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 God is the God who, who is a judge, and he make, justifies the sinner. The word justify means that it's God's declar. Excuse me. See, big words. Now I'm getting tripped up here. It is God's act of declaring a sinner to be in the right. Think about this. This tax collector who had nothing to show for, trusted in none of his righteousness, comes to the throne of God, throws himself at the mercy of God, a sinner, and God sees in him a righteous person. God declares him to be in the right. The tax collector comes with an amazing resume, a portfolio. He walks with his merits. He flashes all of these things before God. God here kind of feels like an audience to him as he's rambling on of how amazing he is. And he leaves condemned. He is not justified. What does this tell us? This tells us that the entrance into the kingdom of God and the way you stand to inherit all the blessings of God is through humility, through faith, through trusting in his righteousness. It's coming to God and saying, God, I've got nothing. Some of you feel like that today. I've got nothing. I've got nothing. God, you're there. Now turn your eyes to Jesus. Put your faith in him. And God is the one who justifies. He declares us right. Let me give you real quick, how this justification works, because it's a big one. It's, 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 it's really the hope of our salvation. It's the doorway into the kingdom, right? He just declares us right, even though we're sinners. How does he do this? Now, I'm going to give you a big word. If you have a date, you can impress somebody. Um, it's called imputation. And in the Bible, we find double imputation. What does that mean? That means think of yourself and Jesus, and something happens between you. There's an exchange First, there's the believer who has their sins in their life. And you know what happens when you come and throw yourself at Jesus? You say, God, I've got nothing, but I trust you. I believe in you. Your sins are imputed to Christ. This is how forgiveness works. Forgiveness is not God sweeping everything under the rug, saying you're good, you're good to go. No, no, no. He pays for it. The mercy is this, that what God's justice required, his mercy provided. What God's justice required, his mercy provided. The mercy is this, that my sins go on Christ. But that's just the one, one direction. In the gospel, my, his righteousness, his 33 years of absolute obedience, his incredible life of following God, Submitted to the Father's will all time. That's his righteousness. Guess what? It becomes my. It is counted as my. It becomes my garments. So that when I place my faith in Jesus and I look to his merit, not my own, and I come with nothing, I stand before God. You ready? Being, wearing his righteousness and my sins are counted to him. That is beautiful. I think most people, most Christians know that first part. Yeah, my sins go on Jesus. No, 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 no. Jesus' righteousness also goes on you. And on the basis of this, you are declared right. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, my favorite verse, says these words. God made him. It's coming. It's my favorite verse, so I should know. Who knew no sin to be sin. Can we go back? Or um, God made him who knew no sin to be sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. You see that? That double imputation. Imputation is sort of, we use that language when, 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 when Seahawks score a touchdown, and we as fans say, we scored! We 
didn't really score, <laughs> and we're not playing, and we're not getting paid, but we're saying we identify, and there is a sharing of victory, right? That's sort of a, a, an idea of imputation, right? So when David slays Goliath, with David slaying of Goliath, all of Israel was victorious. And when Jesus conquers sin on the cross, all of his children and the church and the bride is victorious, because in Jesus, my sins go on him, and his righteousness is imputed to me. And on that basis, we are justified. Man, I am so thrilled by that. But nothing will get in the way of this kind of pleading like self-righteousness. Because it's precisely here the self-righteousness prevents you from focusing on him. It says you are awesome. It's precisely here that self-righteousness blinds you to your sins and says, nope, you don't need Jesus. You can handle God's favor on your own. You can earn your own way to heaven. And it is here that we humble ourselves. The only way up into justification is to go down. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is is the kingdom of heaven. I'll be wrapping up right now. The only way up is down. I believe that what would be important for us to do is to rehearse this gospel. Rehearse the truth that we are sinners in need of mercy and come and acknowledge that we're sinners and come and taste of his mercy. How we can be so self-righteous. And I believe that this kind of humility is the humility that matters. You see, let me, let me give you a couple of thoughts before we end. Typically, a sermon on humility looks like this. It says like this. Let's talk about humility, guys, okay? Now, here's what humility looks like, okay? It looks like you being a good listener, not jumping in, not trying to prove your point, good listener. Humility looks like this. A humble heart is correctable. Somebody offers a critique, you take that well. Here is what humility looks like. You are a servant and you sacrifice for, ev- for everybody. You esteem others higher than yourself. And then what happens is people are said, okay, now let's go home. And let's take one of those things, what humility looks like, what humility does, and let's apply it. And what happens is we might be trying to humble ourselves with an act of taking correction or esteeming somebody others, somebody higher than ourselves, but we never really become humble. The reason is, is because I need to actually know something. I need to know where I'm at, and I need to know who God is. It's a hard thing. Humility, one definition I found that I loved so much is this. Humility is honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. Now, where does that assessment come? With, in the gospel. You see, in the gospel, in rehearsing these truths that I, I'm fallen, but God loves me and he's for me in rehearsing the truths of the gospel over and over, over and over, over and over. Two truths come to bear in my heart. One is my lowly position and two, his glory and beauty. Two things are required for true humility and that is that you honestly assess who you really are. And I want to submit to you That as we practice this word, gospel humility, as we become this tax collector daily, as we plead for his mercy daily, as we focus on the merits of Jesus and our merits daily, we become and grow in the heart of humility. Because then and then we are confronted with two truths, who we are and who God is. And out of that, when you have a humble heart, a gospel humility, gospel humble heart, you are able to be corrected, (laughs) 
Husbands are able to lay their lives down in marriage. Leaders are able to serve others and not wonder, this is beneath me. Why? It's all there. I'm a sinner. Saved by God's incredible mercies. If somebody praises me, that just is like water off my back. I'm I'm someone who needs saving. (laughs) If somebody asks me to serve them and it's beneath me, it's never beneath me. Why? Because I was undeserving and God in Christ served me unto death. You see, this gospel humility, this this opposite of self-righteousness starts to creep up, excuse me, creep out into all of the relationships of our life. I want to end with Apostle, Apostle, Apostle Paul. And I love his growing humility. I pointed this out before, but he has three places where he talks about who he is. And notice how he's growing in humility. In AD 56, in 1 Corinthians, Paul Paul writes these words, for I am the least of the apostles. Who am, and I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. I am the least of the apostles. Now, how many apostles were there? Maybe 14, maybe 15, I don't know, 13. And he's saying, I'm the least of those 13. That's like saying, out of the world's richest 15 billionaires or trillionaires, I'm number 15. That's still pretty good, Paul. (laughs) That's still pretty impressive. Paul will write, if the church of Ephesus a few years later and here he notes something else he writes to me who am less than the least of all the saints the grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and Paul here says as I am the least of all the followers of Jesus that's probably a billion people and then Paul takes it further And in his last letter to Timothy, he writes, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. What humility. And I believe it's not hard to see if you read Paul why he says this. He stood at the beauty and the glory of God. And he was undone with his sins. He was undone and broken. He had a contrite heart. And this is what we do. We come to the gospel and we start practicing the truths, rehearsing the truths of the gospel. We become like this tax collector and we are justified. And then this uh, uh, gospel humility starts to infect all of our relationships. That's where it starts. That's where it starts. If today you are someone who's a follower of Jesus and you've been justified, I want to, you know, self-righteousness is an ever-present danger. I want to call you back to this prayer. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. And if you're somebody here today who's wrapped up in shame and guilt, (laughs) oh my goodness, how good is God? You come to him. You say that very prayer God, be merciful to me. And all heaven breaks loose on your life. Every blessing is going to be yours. You listen to me. Everything that this word, I don't have my Bible up here, promises is going to be yours. Eternal life is yours. It's as good of yours as anybody else's. It doesn't matter how you fall in this week. It doesn't matter the depths of your sin. There is no depth His grace will not reach us from, reach us at. You come to Him. And um, we're going to sing a song. And in a, after a song, I'm going to call us to the table. And what an amazing day today is. That we get to rehearse the gospel by taking part in the bread and the cup. Let's pray. Lord, the justified, the justified, the blessing of being right with you comes about when we throw ourselves at your mercy. We do not come on our own merit. We say, God, no, 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 what you've done matters. So, Lord, I repent today in my personal life of self-righteousness, all of the pride, 
All of the ways I'm impressed with me know God. Today our focus is on you. Our focus is on you, God. Would you forgive us? And would you help humble us that we may take part in the joy of your salvation and beauty?